Welcome to Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters. Today we'll deal with one subject, and that is the recently conducted hearings before the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, chaired by Senator Alan Spector, co-chaired by Bob Kerry. The lead-off witness uh, to, in that uh, uh, hearing, which was prompted by the series of articles in the San Jose Mercury News, uh, alleging uh, contra cocaine connection into South Central Los Angeles involving the Central Intelligence Agency, was Jack Blum, and we're uh, privileged to have uh, Jack Blum with us today. Jack Blum was a special counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for some time, and he was the chief investigator for the Senate Subcommittee on Narcotics, Terrorism, and International Operations, uh, chaired by Senator John Kerry. These hearings took place in 1988, uh, where you looked at the at the uh, the contra drug connection. And just to begin with, uh, uh, Jack Blum, I'm astounded. Um, <clears throat> first of all, in the press coverage of the hearings, you were the lead-off witness. You were followed by Mr. Uh, Heitz, the, the the CIA's um, Inspector General, and then Mr. Bromwich of the Justice Department. Um, but there was no uh, uh, mention of your testimony, which I found fascinating, in both the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times. Uh, what is it? Do they think that, that somehow this is an old story? Uh, I'm not really sure as to why there was no coverage. I don't know whether it was reportorial laziness or whether they simply felt there was nothing new that was added. But I can tell you, even where there was coverage, what you thought happened at that hearing depended on what city you were in. Well, it's it is uh, strange that uh, that uh, people would see this as an old story in the sense that, I mean, none of this has been resolved, has it? I mean, the, the, a great deal of repertorial effort has been put into into analyzing and uh, and debunking the San Jose Mercury news story, but absolutely no effort has been put into looking at uh, the evidence that's extant and that's been hanging since uh, the mid '80s. I think the place to begin is to talk about the complete failure of Congress and the administration to deal intelligently with intelligence reform. Uh, the Cold War is over. The demands on the intelligence community have changed radically. Uh, the time has really come for a serious public review of what we mean by intelligence and what is appropriate for the government to be doing in a world when we don't face the threats that people uh, saw before in international communism. Uh, now, that, that kind of review simply hasn't occurred. In fact, the CIA budget is up, the intelligence community budget is up, even as we're cutting the budget of the State Department and other agencies involved in foreign policy. And uh, I think we should be doing a thorough review of the entire history of intelligence operations and how they connected with uh, both drug trafficking and organized crime. In the sense that uh, we've gone through this tremendous uh, geopolitical transformation since the Cold War, where we, we, our 50 years we're focused on national security and, and, and national defense, and we suddenly in a world in which there are no nation states effectively threatening each other, but the threats come from subnational uh, disintegration of uh, of borders and cultures and religious dif differences and the transnational phenomenon which we'd like to, I'd like to talk about today, which is drugs and crime, and that is clearly uh, on the rise. And <clears throat> indeed, many uh, the former country of the, <laughs> of the Soviet Union, now Russia, is a country completely beset by subnational and transnational. Uh, uh, security threats. Well, the the interesting thing is that uh, drugs have shown up in uh, one civil war after another and one major security problem area after another. So if you look at Bosnia and the problems in Bosnia, many people may not understand that, among other things, the Bosnian war uh, was financed by drug dealing. And people in Europe know that the former Yugoslavia became a center for drug trafficking as this war went on because people had the opportunity in the war zone to, uh, to smuggle and deal uh, in narcotics coming out of South Asia. Well, we you go back to, to Beirut, which was destroyed in an incredible civil war that went on for years, virtually every one of the groups in that civil war was involved in heroin trafficking. Indeed, the Bacca Valley is uh, is the is the jewel in the crown of uh, 
of uh, the, the drug trade in in Lebanon and in uh, Afghanistan, where the war never ended. Uh, the backbone of support for that war is uh, heroin. Uh, the people who are the refugees and the people who continue to fight are funding uh, their existence and their continued ability to fight by uh, growing and distributing opium poppy and then uh, transforming it into heroin and shipping it elsewhere. So there is a tremendous correlation between the problem of narcotics and the problem of uh, war and insurrection. Well, that would lead us then into the, 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 the subject of the hearings. And here in Los Angeles, Jack Blum, uh, there, there's been an enormous uh, and extremely uh, incendiary uh, reaction to the allegations that came forth in the, the series of articles in the San Jose Mercury News. And um, clearly, I mean, at least we can agree on the surface that it seems to me that in that period of the 80s, we were, uh, in order to to uh, prosecute an, an unpopular war that wasn't entirely authorized by the Congress uh, against uh, the Sandinistas, whether there, there was a direct link or not, from that period forth, this country has been beset with the scourge of cocaine and particularly crack cocaine. So damage has been done to the United States. There's no question uh, about it, and I think the problem in discussing this is to separate uh, the issues. Uh, in Los Angeles at the moment, uh, Freeway Ricky Ross is trying to say that his main supplier for cocaine was CIA connected, and that he was a kind of major purveyor of crack cocaine in South Central, and, and therefore he and the CIA had a very important role in uh, inundating uh, Los Angeles with cocaine during that period. There are several things that are wrong with his story and several things wrong with making the argument that this was some sort of plot uh, on the part of the government. Uh, Freeway Ricky was responsible for only a tiny, tiny fraction of the cocaine that came into Los Angeles. And uh, one should be reminded it was pouring in from Mexico. It was coming in from a variety of sources. Uh, it was available not only in South Central, but certainly in the uh, entertainment areas of the city. There were stories about cocaine being sold at the NBC commissary. Uh, there were all kinds of stories about movie stars and rock stars who were going into various treatment centers, and not to mention the athletes. And I don't think they were all being supplied by Freeway Ricky. No, indeed, it was a, a for a while it was a fad in Hollywood, but it had a peculiar trickle down effect. Jack Blum. It started with the rich and famous and and the yuppies, and then they sort of tired of it after a while. It seems. And, well, cocaine, but cocaine it then, does have that natural history. But to go back to the the core of the problem, uh -huh. uh, if you focus only on the freeway Ricky story. Uh, it's very easy for people to deny that the intelligence world was responsible for a huge problem. If you, on the other hand, go back to the hearings we had and go back to the period, what you very quickly find out is that our government systematically kept quiet about, helped, uh, and avoided confronting a variety of people who were responsible, truly responsible, for flooding the entire country with cocaine. And I begin there with General Noriega, who was, by his admission, by uh, various other public statements on the CIA payroll, clearly involved in cocaine trafficking, and we looked the other way because he was supporting us, and that is all documented in Ollie North's diaries. You have the case of Honduras, where uh, the generals in Honduras were involved in the cocaine trade, where we knew they were involved and we knew that they were protecting a major player, a man named Ramon Mataballesteros, and instead of doing anything about it, we actually closed the DEA office because we needed those Honduran generals and we needed the bases in Honduras. For, uh, for the Contra War. For the Contra War. The Contras were, in fact, uh, in operation in Honduras. And that uh, same pattern was followed in Haiti, uh, it uh, colored the way we responded to Mexico as the problems in Mexico surrounding the Camarena murder became apparent. And uh, it, it is a major piece of why the drug cartels were able to entrench themselves 
and get the kind of power and position they did. So either consciously or unconsciously, at a high policy level, during that period, the conditions were created for this Holocaust to happen. Yes. And, and why the, it, that's what I find so extraordinary, that the press is treating this like an old story. But, you know, the Holocaust is an old story, but they're, putting, they're still Nazi war criminals on trial. Uh, there's one in, in Rome as we speak. The problem has been uh, finding a tool for getting accountability for getting a public discussion of what has hitherto been secret policy and secret decisions. I think it is incredibly important in a democracy that when decisions are taken that have this kind of consequence, uh, people fully understand them and debate them. And I would argue that even if you have to make decisions in secret, ultimately, when decisions are taken and the consequences have been badly thought through or not debated, but the people who are responsible for not understanding what the consequences of their actions were, at the very least, be dismissed and taken out of the uh, out of the game. Uh, and if if it's bad enough, probably in some way uh, disciplined or punished. The thing that the intelligence community has been incredibly weak at doing is just that, which is owning up to mistakes and uh, cleaning the mistakes out. Look at the problems they had with the Oliver James case. And it's very tempting in a situation like that to continue uh, applying rules of secrecy beyond all reason, because what those rules of secrecy do is they protect monumental stupidity. Uh, and we've got, to, we've got to break through that, and I think everyone in America should have the opportunity to understand how the decisions were taken and who was saying what to whom. Well, indeed, it it as I say, you know, justice delayed is justice denied, and uh, and it's extraordinary that nobody wants to 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 touch this. And and you tried in nineteen in your nineteen eighty eight hearings uh, uh, to investigate the entire uh, uh, arena that we're talking about, and I understand that you, that back then you were thwarted at every turn. Yes, indeed, the investigation that we ran. Uh, was one that we had to work out through uh, what I would call the obvious back door, uh, because the government uh, people would not give us access to their documents, or when they did, the documents were highly classified. We had to do the other thing, which is go out into the field and talk to the people who knew what was going on. And as I said in the hearing, what is uh, considered a grave secret in Washington is frequently very obvious when you get out in the field and you talk to people. Uh, what we found in the field was lots of people understood that the war had both created the conditions for drug trafficking and that there were drug traffickers who were flying the airplanes and uh, running the supplies and doing all kinds of other things uh, in the Contra support operation. We had at one point testimony from a pilot who at different times in his career was flying drugs for himself, uh, flying supplies for the conference, flying supplies for the humanitarian relief organization, uh, and working as an undercover for the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Customs Service. And the way we came upon him was he was a photographer at the Miami International Airport who became interested in old junk airplanes. And he saw this one airplane, a DC-4, that was being repainted almost every week. And he would take photographs as one tail number would be painted out and another one painted on. And he gave us the complete set of photographs. And it turned out this was the one airplane, and every time it flew a mission for a different uh, agency or for a different whatever, uh, they changed its look and they changed its tail number. Uh, and the guy who was the pilot figured, well, I'm doing all this work for different parts of the government. I can do a little bit for myself on the side. Uh, that kind of uh, idiocy was uh, rampant during that period. And, and uh, I, in a sense, the, the, if we go back to that period uh, and, and uh, uh, put the context of President Reagan being elected, wanting to draw a line in the sand, the sense that uh, the Sandinistas were were surrogates of the Cubans, and uh, 
that uh, the, you know the, there was a sort of ineffective rebirth of the Cold War. It ended, ended up being the last gasp of the Cold War. But at the time, there was a great deal of. Uh, the, uh, it's fair to say <laughs> that the line in the sand was drawn, right, Jack Blum? Yes, there's there's no doubt that that's what they were doing. But now let's consider what had gone on inside the intelligence community. Serious analysts at the CIA in the late seventies had reported that uh, the Russian economy was in a state of collapse and they could not ever hope to continue the sustained level of spending needed to keep pace in the Cold War. When those people reported to their superiors, they were told that their reports were unacceptable, and uh, Gates, who was then in charge of the uh, intelligence analysis product, sacked these people and appointed a so-called Team B, that came back and said that the Soviet threat was uh, even worse than anybody had thought. At the beginning of the Reagan administration, there was actually a general who was assigned to the White House who was suggesting that the threat was so dire that we probably ought to do a preemptive strike. And thank goodness he was sacked because even those people realized how extreme he was. Uh, The point here is that there was a completely ideologically driven analysis of reality. And uh, in my judgment, that ideologically driven analysis of reality cost the American taxpayers about a trillion dollars in weaponry that we probably didn't need to build. And, I, and I would also I would also argue, and I think it's it's uh, correct to say that it led to a complete wrong analysis of what the threat to the United States was during the period. Mm-hmm. Because any rational man who looked at what was going on in America, looked at the tons of drugs coming into the city, looked at uh, the kinds of gang warfare we had. We actually had a, a shootout in Miami, uh, which uh, is called in the history of the drug war the Dadeland Massacre, where a group of uh, drug traffickers actually drove a war wagon into the mall at uh, Dadeland in South Miami, and the place was shot up. Uh, And this was the kind of stuff that was happening on the streets of America. Uh, My argument runs, when you have that kind of warfare on the streets of America, that's a real security threat, especially when the threat is in fact coming from outside the United States. At the same time, I I would tell you with certainty that there were no Sandinistas running around Miami shooting people. And indeed, since uh, since the early 80s, this problem has exponentially gotten worse, and as the as the big enemy has gone away, uh, the 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 appearance and the reality of the extent to which we have a, a national security problem within our own country should become more and more clear. Surely, sure. But and, but and let me another part to this, which I think is worth considering is that many of the threats that we now recognize and we're now turning around to deal with are threats that come out of the earlier blindness. So in our zeal to promote the war in Afghanistan, we turned a blind eye to the uh, extremism and uh, the the extremism of the people who were doing the training in Afghanistan and what they were saying and what they were doing. Uh, as a consequence, there are alumni of those training camps who are now busily planting bombs all over the world and who have become an enormous problem uh, for every organized society. Jack Lum, let's just go, go back to the early 80s and the Sandinist War in the sense that this was the genesis of this problem that is, uh, that is besetting the, the inner cities of this country and uh, has turned south-central Los Angeles into a war zone. And... Um, this, the price we're paying is exponentially getting greater as as the crack babies become have to be uh, taken through schools, etc. It, it, there's a myriad of, of of evidence of how heinous it all is. But uh, the going back to the 80s, initially the Congress only appropriated I think about 19 million uh, f- uh, for the war against uh, or to f- support the Contras in a surrogate war against the Sandinistas, and then uh, then in the mid 80s the, the funding was cut off and and. That's pretty much when Oliver North comes into the picture, right? Yes, but you have to understand that if you had done, as I did, a a kind of discussion with Sandinista, uh, with uh, Contras on the ground, Mm -hmm. that is the people who are going into Nicaragua to fight, they would tell you that the levels of funding and who got money from where were largely irrelevant to their lives because almost none of that money actually trickled down to people who were trying to fight the war. 
Uh, it got siphoned off at different levels to arms dealers, to their own leadership, which maintained houses in multiple cities and uh, lived very, very high. And uh, I met with those people uh, uh, at, in Miami in 1986 and again in 1989. And I'll never forget a meeting with three Contra veterans, uh, seriously wounded during the war, one of them blind, another one had lost limb. And, and they're explaining to me that if we ever have to fight a revolution, we don't want to be part of anything run by your government. Because we never saw any of the money, we never saw any of the support. What that war became was an enormous business and profit opportunity. So the idea that the money was generated by drug trafficking to support a war effort was wrong. What happened was the war and what happened in and around it gave everybody the excuse for having a field day and gave them an enormous profit opportunity, and they took full advantage of it. So you had traffickers who had airstrips, who had access to the United States. You had government officials who knew that nobody would confront them with their uh, accepting bribes and, and with their dealings uh, simply because we needed them too badly, so they took advantage of it. And before it was over, we had managed to have a what was a mom-and-pop industry uh, where small growers dealt with small refiners who dealt with small traffickers transformed into a major multinational business organization, vertically integrated with tremendous financial resources. And by the time the war was over, we were now no longer dealing with a small smuggling operation here and a small farmer there. We were dealing with very large, very well-equipped, very well-armed organizations that had the capacity to steal countries. And, of course, the key to uh, drug trafficking, surely, is to get it across the United States border. And didn't this war and these, these conditions that were created uh, make this a lot easier? In the sense, well, uh, there were two ways that it made it easier. One of them was that virtually everyone who was in the smuggling game tried to pretend like he, one way or another, was part and parcel of the resources the United States was using in the war. So virtually every time... An arrest was made in Miami, or an arrest was made of some small airplane. The guy would say, "Hey, I'm I'm working for fill in the blank," uh, and it would be one agency or another in support of the Contras, flying supplies to the Contras, uh, whatever the excuse was. Uh, these people were always there, ready to say they were working for the government. Uh, it became a refrain during the period. There were times when, in fact, uh, inspections were relaxed. We knew that. Uh, there would be orders that came over saying, don't look at this shipment inbound, outbound, or whatever. It was never clear to me that that was properly controlled and properly supervised. So it's quite possible that some of the shipments that weren't inspected uh, contained drugs. Well, so I think all of this all of this created an environment where people were able to move move uh, aircraft and quantities of cocaine that really uh, we couldn't do very much about. But it, but what well, I think that the, the, it seems to be where the San Jose Mercury News article got slammed in both. There was a th three day series of articles in the L.A. Times uh, going through uh, point by point and basically. Uh, suggesting he got most of it wrong. And um, first of all, do you think that the focus uh, that the CIA were, were were dealing drugs was was the wrong focus? In as much as as uh, the I, in your testimony before the for, recently before the the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, you pointed out that the, there was more culpability at the level of policymakers. Right. I I think that it is a mistake to say that uh, first that there was any kind of plot to do African Americans in South Central. Second, I'm, I'm certain that nobody on a U.S. government payroll uh, actually said, hey, let's sell some cocaine to these people to raise money for something that Congress won't appropriate money for. I'm certain that that never happened. Uh, I, I'm equally certain that people who they used as contractors uh, had side businesses, and among the side businesses uh, was dealing cocaine. I know that they knew that those contractors had side businesses, and I know that they said, hey, that's not our problem. That is the problem of law enforcement people. We're just going to close our eyes to what they're doing. 
Now, that's substantially different than the charge made in the San Jose Mercury. What Gary Webb has done for us has given us the opportunity to say it's time to do a real history of the period and a real look back in the context of a serious uh, uh, consideration of where we ought to go in intelligence reform. And that discussion has not been had. Well, I could... Nobody has tried to really put on the table all of the facts of all of these different things that have gone on to say, we really have to rethink the way we go about this business and make sure that it doesn't happen this way in the future. Well, uh, Jack Blummer, I think one could also add to that call and suggest that that since the major newspaper, particularly our local paper here, the Los Angeles Times, have gone to such lengths to to try and disprove a connection between the CIA and 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 crack cocaine in South Central. It's as though, well, we've disproved that, and now let's walk away and forget it. What about the Holocaust itself? Isn't Surely this is an opportunity for the whole country to focus on the incredible damage done to the fabric of this society and to the lives of these people in the... Now in you've touched on another area that is off the table for debate in the United States, but really ought to be a very central concern for every citizen of the country. If you are an African-American living in the inner city, your view of the United States of America is this is a police state which will ultimately imprison me somewhere along the line. The percentage of uh, young black males that go through the criminal justice system is absolutely shocking. And what we've done is we've created a situation where once imprisoned, uh, those young black males are stripped of all of their rights for all time. They lose... uh, the right to vote, they'll lose the right or the ability to collect a welfare payment under the new legislation, they lose all kinds of rights. And they will note and correctly observe that in the prisons that they're sent to, they'll be asked to do prison labor. And from their perspective, what this is is grossly unfair, because when you have a white person, for example, a recent example of a star on an NBC sitcom, Uh, has a cocaine blow-up, he goes off to Betty Ford, and they come up with some fill-in episodes, and he'll be right back on the job as soon as he's dried out. Uh, Change the color of the skin and the context, and the guy is going to be in the tank, and he's going to be deprived of his rights. So we have a very serious perception problem, which is backed by reality, which is the focus of drug law enforcement has been the African-American and the minority community, and it has been extraordinarily punitive, and that has been matched by the use of the code words in American politics of drugs, uh, inner city, uh, and uh, crime uh, as a substitute for talking raw race. Now, we've got to acknowledge that, and we've got to look at it. We've got to understand how it looks to people who uh, are in the inner city, And we've got to understand the damage it's doing to the perception of equality of justice in the United States. Uh, And I think that this uh, really, the reaction of the community, uh, really underscores how seriously different the perceptions are, uh, depending on where one lives and the color of one's skin. And that's a very dangerous proposition for democratic society. Let me just remind the audience again, if I may, that I'm speaking with Jack Blum, who is a special... A counsel for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for a number of years. Uh, I think what about fifteen, twenty years, Jack? You no, well, I I actually mm-hmm. worked for the Senate for a total of fourteen years, fourteen and on and off. Uh, and so that, it's not it wasn't continuous service. Sure, and that but and you were the chief investigator for the Senate subcommittee on narcotics terrorism and and international operations in nineteen eighty eight that was chaired by Senator John Kerry that looked into the activities of the Contras and uh, the cocaine shipping that went on there, and we're talking about uh, this in the context of uh, hearings that you had about a week and a half ago uh, before Senator Specter and Bob Kerry, the co-chairs of the Senate Select Intelligence Committee. You gave testimony if we're going into that. Uh, back to the idea of, of, uh, of um, uh, reform in terms of uh, the, C- the CIA. I mean, first of all, how can you reform uh, the situation when, as far as I can see, one of the problems is, if we go back to Oliver North and the Reagan White House, one of the problems is, and I believe there was a lot of resistance in the CIA to, to some of the stuff that North and Casey were up to from the old-timers. I mean, 
Isn't it true that the CIA and other government agencies are, in, for all intents and purposes, toys of the executive branch? They're the ones that get blamed for the for the misdeeds, but the orders come from the from the policy people from the White oh, House. There's no question about that, and I think it's one of the uh, points I tried to make in the testimony that it's uh, easy for people to either say the CIA did it or the CIA didn't do it. Whatever they did or didn't do, uh, somebody at a political level had a hand in. And uh, it's uh, at the political level that the real, uh, the real kind of judgment has to take place. But we also have to know what happened at the political level as citizens to be able to make that judgment. Uh, there's, a, there's a rule here, a rule of thumb that uh, one ought to understand. The oldest single problem in politics uh, since the beginning of time have been lies that have been told by people in power to give them the freedom to do whatever they want. Uh, Probably the oldest recorded lie in the history of politics was Pharaoh, who said, I'm God. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have some uh, others, uh, you know, coming down the line to Louis XIV, who said, God made me king. But those lies became the basis for giving the uh, uh, ruler or the person in authority the power to do whatever he wanted. And if you couple a large lie with a whole lot of secrecy, uh, really you do have agencies that are the toy of the executive. And it becomes a very attractive and easy thing to do. Uh, Our entire democratic uh, government here in the United States, our Constitution, is built around the proposition that we don't let people do that kind of thing. Uh, I worked uh, for a wonderful man, Senator Philip Hart of Michigan, who, when he was retiring, uh, was asked by a reporter, well, Senator, uh, what can you say looking back over your career? Because, after all, many of the things you really wanted to do, you didn't accomplish. And uh, Senator Hart looked at him and he said, you really don't understand the Constitution. It was written so I couldn't. It was written so no one man can ride in on a white horse and do what he feels like doing. This is a government of checks and balances, of of supervision and uh, criticism. And everything you do has to be seen by other people, and other people have to sign off on it. Yeah, but that's if, what makes the country strong. But, Jack, if you don't know what's going on, you don't have a, have a hope. That's my point precisely. I believe that if any of these things had been discussed publicly, they never would have occurred. Mm. If anybody had said, uh, gee, we have this drug problem with a fellow named Noriega, should he be on the payroll? Uh, it, it wouldn't have survived ten seconds. Now, maybe you can't say all of that quite publicly, but, God, if there had been even real political understanding of what was going on uh, by policymakers who maybe didn't talk to the constituents, someone would have said, wait a minute, this is bloody stupid. Mm. But instead, uh, it was all swept under the rug, and even as it began to emerge, what you got out of the administration, instead of acknowledging the problem, was one denial after another and one attempt after another to cover it up. And I think that that is where uh, democratic institutions really took a hit. And in in your subcommittee that you are the chief investigator for, convened in 88, uh, Narcotics, Terrorism, and International Operations, you really did do a lot of work trying to, to, to find out what went on in this period and who was culpable. And I take it that every step of the way, uh, as you went up the chain, particularly in the Justice Department, you were thwarted. We had terrible problems at the Justice Department. We had problems with the State Department. The administration as a whole simply turned off and said, uh, we really don't want to help you do what you're trying to do here. Uh, we want to uh, keep this all secret, and uh, we don't want it to uh, discuss publicly. And they went beyond simply not giving us access to where we were able to find witnesses and have public hearings, calling the newspapers the day of the hearing to say, don't believe these witnesses, they're full of it, they're liars, uh, here's what they said some other time and place, and really tried to trash uh, the work we were doing as we were doing it. Now, the, the strength of what they said, they, they were taken at face value, and many editors uh, deliberately played down both the hearings and the report because the administration had so tarnished what we were trying to do. I think the report stands up. I think the work we did stands up. 
And time and again, I've run into people who said, you people were really way ahead of your time because many of the things you talked about then have now become obvious and apparent, and we should have paid more attention. And indeed, many of what you talked about then and investigated then have resurfaced because of these articles in the in the in the um, San Jose Mercury News. But but there's been this peculiar backlash where the 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 watchdogs, the press, seem to be really anxious to suggest that there's some details wrong, but totally unwilling to look at the historical record, which, as you've pointed out, is just you know reeks of of of. Uh, complicity of government uh, turning the blind eye of creating these kind of conditions. I mean, this is isn't the, isn't this when this problem started? I think that uh, you know, looking at long historical patterns is the way you come to understand what the trouble is in the intelligence world or has been. And, mm-hmm. and I want to here separate uh, so that the audience fully understands what I'm talking about. There are a lot of people who work in intelligence. Most of those people are information gatherers, and uh, they're very, very good. They they go about their business very quietly, as they should. Uh, they bring the information back, filter it, sift us, and help the government make decisions. But there's the other world, and that's really the world we're talking about, which is the covert operations world, where people say, we're going to change the way some government is operating, or we're going to change the government. And in that world, there is a kind of subset, not of a real covert operation, but where in preparation or or with, with a view to the possibility that there might be a covert operation, people in the intelligence community maintain liaison with people who are likely to be helpful in a difficult situation in the future. So it's it's that world that we're really talking about that needs the scrutiny and the reform. But but there's a history to that world itself, isn't there? The there was long history, there's long two history. well let's just start with two incidents when Jim Schlesinger fired a whole bunch of people from the operations and then later Stansfield Turner fired, uh, I think, about 1,200 people from the operations division. This is the so-called Dirty Tricks Covert Activities Division of the black part of the CIA. Um, But were they not all rehired, or a lot of these people were rehired by uh, Bill Casey? And and you've mentioned many times that, that, that at the heart of this Contra drug problem were the contractors. So these are the... There were real problems with contractors and people who were brought in and people to whom things were delegated and proxies where we encouraged certain other foreign governments to do things that uh, really went far beyond the pale. So our dealings with the military people in Argentina, I think, were most extraordinary and uh, really quite reprehensible. Uh, there, there are other examples of it, uh, and and I think that again is part of the issue of supervision and reform, of public discussion and accountability. Uh, there's another point that I think is very important. For a long period of time, people mentally were separating the problems of the inner city and the problems of the social fabric in America from foreign policy problems. Uh, on one level, people would say, hey, if we're engaged in a war on communism, that's a foreign policy issue, and that's to be discussed uh, by the gurus who know about foreign policy and by people in that establishment, and that's that problem. And then they come to a different compartment called the problems of the inner cities, and that's domestic policy, and that's a whole different cast of people. Uh, turned out that those uh, problems were intimately connected. And uh, the connection was completely missed, and largely because of complacency on the part of people who dealt with domestic problems and and the failure on their part to recognize the connection, the foreign policy people were able to sell uh, ideas and policies and uh, allow their work to carry on well beyond a time when there should have been political protest. Well, you know, Jack, I've spoken with uh, with uh, uh, former Secretary of State uh, Al Haig, and you know, he 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 had a, a very difficult time. And uh, if it wasn't for uh, for um, Weinberger at the Pentagon and others, um, the Falklands War may have been a t- totally different situation. And 
you know, it's, it, you'd think that anybody in the, in the highest levels of the White House would understand the obvious that in foreign policy, America's biggest foreign policy and security arrangement is NATO, particularly back mm-hmm. then when the Cold War was on, and America's biggest partner in NATO was Britain. Right. But there was this cabal led by Bill Casey and Gene Kirkpatrick who were protecting the Contras, which was their mm-hmm. secret operation, and that was that had been contracted out to the Argentinians, and the Argentinians uh, w- thought that they had Bill Casey and and Gene Kirkpatrick on their side, and, uh, and they made a phenomenal mistake. They they didn't understand that in the crunch, uh, uh, Casey and Kirkpatrick could not carry the day, and the uh, consequences for the Argentine generals was in the end, I think, fortunately, catastrophic. Uh, they were as bad a bunch as we've seen in the hemisphere in a long time. Uh, that we would do business with them, that we would use them as a proxy, that they would be the original trainers of the Contras, and then that they would be supporting a whole kind of anti-communist battalion through drug trafficking, uh, is uh, quite extraordinary. And that we encourage them to do it is beyond extraordinary. And they, before the, 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 the CIA took them on to train the Contras in, in Honduras, they, this same group were responsible for the cocaine coup in, uh, in, in Bolivia. Bolivia, were they not? But I, I think you, one has to correct you. You said the CIA took them on. It's right. not. It's the government. Sure, sure. And the question is who in government and at what policy level? And these are questions which we have yet to see the answer to, which I think the American public is entitled to answers to. And yes, it may be historical, but it's absolutely crucial to understanding how the machinery works so that that machinery in the post-Cold War environment can be reformed. But we don't need the secrecy and the kind of institutional arrangements we had during the Cold War in the current environment. We need a completely different approach to thinking about these issues. But but how how do we? I mean, we obviously at the heart of this whole story are these characters that they have loosely called the cowboys, the contractors, mm-hmm. and it's and, and and I'm just trying to get a handle on this, Jack Blum. If uh, I mean, it's as though the CIA is a, is a, is saying where they're just the piano player in the whorehouse. You know, they have they have insulation. Who actually hires these people? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the logic of how it happens, I think, is obvious and straightforward. Uh, people are sent to wherever they're sent, and they're told, you have a job to do. Uh, you have to find people who will do it. And if you're trying to find people to do that kind of job, uh, you're going to look around for someone who's willing to do something that's illegal, because after all, flying weapons to a covert war is not legal. Someone who's willing to take tremendous risks for money. Uh, someone who is uh, able to get around the rules and regulations of where they're playing. Now, the man you've just sent out to do this is maybe risking his life for his country and doing something he thinks is his patriotic assignment. The guy he's going to reach out for, for the help, is likely going to be someone connected with the criminal world or the underworld. Now, you cannot expect that when you're dealing with those people, you'll get them to only do what you want them to do. Uh, Any police officer who's ever run an informant can tell you how difficult it is to keep the informant from committing crimes while he's working for the police. And that's a terrible problem that covert operations confront. Uh, it requires very good management. It requires very close supervision, if it should be done at all, ever. Uh, in this case, there was no management, no supervision, and uh, it got totally and completely out of control. And in, in effect, though, it, it didn't, didn't uh, the, the, uh, the Reagan White House, particularly Colonel North, uh, particularly when the, when, uh, during the Boland Amendment period, they and and we saw the whole testimony in the in the Iran Contra mm-hmm. hearing. They talked about having this off the shelf, independent, the enterprise. Um, so the the enterprise was run and managed by a group of people who were at best incompetent uh, and uh, at worst incredibly dangerous to themselves and to the American national interest. The idea that you could take what what is already a dubious proposition, which is having our government people running it, and then turn it over to a combination of amateurs and has-beens and private contractors, and 
and expect that the whole thing not turn totally catastrophic is a folly. But the, but the one of the reasons the government there was resist. I mean, North North and and Hakim. I can't remember their names now. Secord Hakim. I think his name was. Yeah. They were boasting in front of the United States Senate. Uh, that 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 uh, you know that the, the professionals, the CIA, were just too conservative, and that what the country really needed was was this sort of swashbuckling buccaneers. You know, I mean, well, <laughs> the, the problem here is that uh, if you have a swashbuckling buccaneer who has it in his head what the idea of the national interest is, and he goes off and swashes and buckles, if you will. <laughs> Uh, what you've done is you've given up on democracy. Uh, the whole idea of the way our government works is no individual may ever go off into the night and say, I feel like doing this, I'm going to do it. Uh, everybody, from the president up and down, is sworn to uphold the law. After all, that's why we call it an administration. And uh, they are subject to political checks and balances. Uh, what we had here were a group of people who said, we're not interested in that. We really don't care about the Constitution. We figured out what the national interest is, and by God, if there's nobody else with the courage to go out and do it our way, we're going to do it, and, and the devil take them. Well, uh, you, we, that's just not the Constitution of the United States, and thank you. I think that they uh, have to be brought up short. We do have a, a very, very good form of government. And uh, many of us uh, have on occasion sworn to uh, give our lives to defend it. And uh, I think that uh, it merits that kind of defense. And I think the people who uh, went off as cowboys did us an enormous disservice. Well, but the cowboys, to some extent, at least uh, one group of them were, were organized by Oliver North. And in your testimony, you said you made the extraordinary point that still to this day nobody's been, and the Senate Select Intelligence Committee still has these original diaries apparently nobody's looked at the original diaries he was given the extraordinary privilege of being able to censor them himself well here's here's the history of those diaries which I think most people don't know about Oliver North day by day kept spiral bound notebooks in which he kept a detailed record of his meetings his telephone conversations and what he was doing and this is as good a contemporaneous record of everything the man was into as you'll ever find. When he was fired, finally fired, he collected all of these spiral-bound notebooks and hauled them out of the White House with him. Now, those notebooks were, uh, when, when the investigators became aware of their existence, were immediately classified at the highest levels of U.S. security classification, the so-called code word compartmented, secret compartmented information. And yet North and his lawyers were permitted to keep the notebooks. Moreover, the lawyers uh, cut an arrangement with the Iran-Contra Committee uh, that the only parts of the notebooks they would turn over to the Iran-Contra Committee were those which were, quote, relevant and the people who determined the relevance were North's lawyers. The uh, counsel for the Iran-Contra Committee and uh, some staff looked at the originals for a brief period and uh, signed off on the fact that they would only receive the parts that had been disclosed by the lawyers. The problem was you couldn't possibly know what you were looking at until you'd studied it in detail. It took me two days to get used to his handwriting to the point where I could read them coherently. So uh, the Senate counsel and the House counsel of the Iran-Contra Committee never really understood what it was they were giving up when they said, we'll take an edited version. Now, when we uh, got into the investigation, we subpoenaed North for the originals. His lawyers fought the Foreign Relations Committee tooth and nail. There were members of the Foreign Relations Committee who said, well, we shouldn't push it. The government could never answer for the benefit of the committee why they permitted this top-secret information done on government time with government money, government notebooks, to wind up in private hands uh, outside of the reach of the Senate committee. Uh, I think that North's notebooks should be obtained, should be examined, and should be completely declassified. I think that it would be a great service to the understanding of what should never again occur in foreign policy, to have that record absolutely open and absolutely public. 
But aren't there an, an, a, a huge number of references to drug trafficking? There are quite a number of references to drug trafficking in the notebooks. Mm. And uh, there are times when the references are uh, most extraordinary. For example, the conversations with Noriega, the allusions to drug problems on the Southern Front. Uh, and there are tra- times when there are references or there were memoranda or prof notes relating to drug problems that were cooked essentially to destroy uh, people who were in the way, people who North or others wanted out of the picture because they were a threat, either they were supplying weapons at a competitive price or they were doing something that North didn't like. So the, the drug problem became a two-edged sword. Sometimes he took advantage of it, sometimes he tarred people with it uh, uh, improperly. But no, at no time did he report it, and, and uh, indeed there was hearings, you know, that uh, Congressman Hughes of the House Judiciary Committee held into the fact that North leaked uh, information, uh, photographs of Barry Seal, mm-hmm. who was an undercover well, pilot. You know, when you say that North never reported it, remember North was working at the National Security Council, and he did report it to the National Security Advisor to the President. Mm-hmm. The question one is compelled to ask is, how much higher do you have to report it? Mm-hmm. And what exactly does it take for somebody to say the government knew? Uh, if North knew and he told Poindexter, uh, that is as close to the top of the pyramid of the American government as anybody can possibly get. Uh, and, and I think it's disingenuous to say the government didn't know because they, in fact, were the government. Well, then how do you feel, though, in terms of North's culpability? Get, I mean, in, in, the, in the best of all possible worlds, it seems to me that uh, he was never really tried. He was given tremendous uh, and, privileges. And he, not only was he allowed to skate, but uh, the people at the very top who should have known uh, had their uh, convictions and their prosecutions overturned. Uh, you do remember that our uh, Secretary of Defense was uh, uh, pardoned by uh, by the President as he was about to be indicted, mm-hmm. which was a most extraordinary situation. Uh, and that got very little attention. I think people were not focused on how bad a mess that was. And I really blame the uh, Democratic Party for not making enough of an issue of it and for not focusing it enough, there was a real reluctance on the part of people, and I don't understand why, to take the issue on and really expose the degree to which the government had gone a constitutional, had forgotten about the procedures and methods laid out in law, and uh, simply done what it felt like. And I think the, the Weinberger problem uh, is illustrative of how far off the rails we got. Well, Jack Blum, just, just in the last few minutes, you, you uh, uh, in your testimony uh, a little over a week ago before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, um, where you recounted your efforts in, in 1988 and 1989 uh, to, to uncover... Uh, the the activities of, of drug trafficking in in the Contra movement on the subcommittee on narcotics terrorism and in, in international operations, you also mentioned that just every time you would find uh, find out about uh, some nefarious character that was operating, either semi officially officially or or uh, or just sort of uh, hitching a ride in this climate that we've talked about that was created down there, um, that you kept being blocked by the, crim- the head of the criminal division at the Justice Department, William Weld, who incidentally mm-hmm. is running in a very tight race against John Kerry, who was the uh, chair of the, uh, the the committee that you were investigating. and, and well, We the- ran into situations like this. There was an assistant United States attorney that reported uh, uh, to uh, Senator Kerry that he had overheard a conversation in which uh, a U.S. attorney was being instructed to... Uh, in effect, uh, kill a case because the case might interfere with the Contra operation. Uh, That assistant U.S. attorney was disciplined and his career was ruined. Uh, There were other situations where I was told uh, that there were assistants who were working on cases and the cases had been uh, uh, shut down, in effect, because uh, of the connections with the Contra war. When we tried to get those people to talk, they said they'd been told flat out that if they told us anything in an on-the-record way, 
that their careers at the Justice Department and after would be ruined. Uh, it's that kind of stuff that turned up again and again and again. It was uh, how do we prevent uh, Congress from finding out? Now, I, I said to Senator Specter that, in fact, if you ask me the question, can I say for sure that certain kinds of covert operations were uh, sanctioned and that uh, the government knew, the answer is no. I didn't see the government's files. But on the other hand, can I say that there were plenty of people who told me what was going on, and so many, and it came from so many different directions, I was pretty sure that I was right. Uh, that's a different matter, and uh, I was pretty sure that I was right. The difficulty, of course, is that uh, uh, truth becomes whatever someone arguing one side of the case or the other would like it to be. So the standard that was set by the people who were trying to cover everything up was, tell us what's in our secret files, tell us that without your ever being allowed to have access to them, and by the way, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that everybody who you've talked to is telling the truth. Uh, and against that standard, you really have one very difficult time. But I would turn around and say, excuse me, gentlemen, why don't you just open your eyes and look around? Uh, here are the things we can look at and know uh, based on the absolutely obvious. Uh, drug traffickers living openly in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Uh, generals are protecting him. He's renting a home to the U.S. ambassador. Everybody knows he's there. And our government mysteriously decides to close the DEA office in Honduras. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have to read the secret papers. I have a pretty good idea why that office was closed. And later on, we talked to the DEA agent. He said, I couldn't understand it. All I knew was that the problem was in Honduras. It wasn't in Guatemala where they sent me. So I, I was arguing there were plenty of ways to see this, and it was just a matter of looking at the obvious. Well, Jack Blum, I, I, I thank you very much for joining us. This is an extraordinary subject, and, and as I say, justice is, is long delayed and still denied. And and um, I don't know if you're as frustrated as I am in the sense that I, I just wish that people would go back to the source and deal and deal with these problems and and, and, and work their way up the, the problem and, and deal with it in general because, as you pointed out in the beginning, this is the real national security threat of the present and the future. I think that what we have to do is get people to realize that foreign and domestic policy increasingly are the same thing. That the way we deal with foreign policy colors the way we deal with domestic issues, and that it's time to put a lot more of this in the open and on the table, uh, and to talk about it and make it part of our overall political debate. I think the time for the level of secrecy we had in the Cold War period is over, the kind of uh, operations we had in the Cold War period is over, and we need to, to create a new climate in which this takes place, and that requires very major rethinking of the way we go about our business, and to date, I haven't seen it. I'd very much like to see it, and I'd like to see the debate joined. It shouldn't be my voice alone. There are plenty of people who have other ideas, uh, people who disagree with me. I think the debate would be very, very healthy. I thank you for joining us in Los Angeles, Jack Blum. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And hello again, I'm Ian Masters. I was just speaking then with Jack Blum, who for 14 years was the special counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he was the chief investigator for the Senate Subcommittee on Narcotics, Terrorism, and International Operations in 1988. And we were talking about his recent testimony before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence um, about a week and a half ago where he testified and laid out a broader canvas. Uh, these hearings, of course, were, were held in response to the articles by uh, Gary Webb and the San Jose Mercury News, which um, have been largely panned in by the mainstream press. But, as I say, Jack uh, Blum's uh, experience and scope and understanding of the, of the genesis and of the problem and uh, the broader canvas uh, remains... Um, undiscussed in the, the broader issues that he talked about uh, have yet to be debated. I thank uh, Madeleine Schwab for the board operating. This program is heard live every Sunday at 11 and rebroadcast on Monday at 2 p.m. I'll be back again next Sunday at 11. Have a very pleasant week. Bye.